everybody. Jeff Hampton with Hampton Criminal Defense Attorneys. What do cops and lawyers know about search warrants that you don't? Listen, I want to give you just a quick primer, walk you through from start to finish, some important information to know about search warrants in case you or a loved one find yourself on the wrong end of an officer showing up trying to execute a search warrant. Now, look, we all know that fourth, the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution is designed to provide protection against unreasonable search and seizures. Just because police show up at your house claiming, or maybe your private property or your business, claiming they have a search warrant, does that mean they can just do whatever they want? Let's examine that. First, do the police, let's examine this first question here, do the police have to knock on your door or any other door of someone's property to inform them that they have a search warrant, that their presence is there? Not all the time and not necessarily. For instance, in Texas, what is known as no-knock warrants are legal. Now, not all states is that the case, but in many states it is. Essentially, this gives the police the right to search a home, a business, or other properties without having to knock and announce who they are. So they can literally just barrel through the door of somewhere and begin a search. Now, the supposed reason for why this is allowed under Supreme Court law is that it's to keep suspects from destroying evidence or to avoid some type of, you know, violent interaction or violent altercation. Now, police do not just get a no-knock warrant by default, though. It is important that the search warrant must be signed by a district judge in Texas. Um, and also, that's that usually the SWAT team has to end up executing this. There are certain requirements that each state have, what may have in this situation. But the reality of it is many states do allow no-knock warrants. In fact, in the 1997 case of Richards versus Wisconsin, the United States Supreme Court held that the Fourth Amendment does not allow, and this is key, there is a limitation to this, it does not allow a, quote, blanket exception to the knock and announce requirement for drug cases. Rather, the court said that police must have case-specific evidence that an unannounced entry is reasonable in light of the concerns about, here's the two points, a threat of physical violence or destruction of evidence. So they must specifically articulate those two primary, one of those two reasons, as reasonably the reason why they did not knock at the door to execute that search warrant, okay? Now, no-knock warrants are very dangerous. In fact, I, I can tell you right now there have been people, a number of people who have died as a result of this. Think about this. You're in your home, especially late night, you're asleep. All of a sudden, your front door comes off its hinges and people start rushing into your house. And this has happened particularly in Texas. If you're a homeowner, if you're a homeowner and you've got a gun, right? You're a gun owner and somebody comes in your door, you have no idea who they are. They didn't announce themselves. There's been a number of instances where the homeowner then turns around and pulls out their gun and starts shooting at people coming in the front door, right? Well, it's cops. What do cops do? They return fire. You end up with homeowners dead. You end up with cops dead. And so it's especially tra tragic in situations where we've seen where actually officers go looking for drugs. They find no drugs, but there ends up being a homeowner that's dead. Or there ends up being a police officer that, that is dead because they did not knock and they did not follow that protocol. So, in fact, nationwide, 22 people have been killed in no-knock events since 2015. And the person killed in at least five of those raids was not a person of interest at all. Just an innocent person killed as a result of a no-knock warrant. Okay. Now, first, let me ask you this. So, we talked about this. Do the cops have to announce themselves at your front door? Not necessarily. But if they do knock, do you have to open the door? That's the next question we have is number two. And here's the thing. If it's a valid warrant, yes, you do. You better, unless you don't, unless you want them to, you know, knock down your door. If it's a valid warrant, absolutely. And in fact, you don't know if it's a valid warrant. So if they knock on your front door and they claim they've got a search warrant, you're going to need to open that door or they're going to knock it down. That's the reality of it is. So, and why? Because a signed search warrant then allows, this is now deemed to be reasonable um, under the fourth amendment because the judge signed off on it. So, what happens if you open the door and they have a warrant? Number one, let me give you some specific things that you should do. Let's say you open that front door. Here's an officer. He see, he's got a warrant in his hand and he's saying, I'm here to execute a search warrant. Let me in. Number one, the first thing you do is ask for a copy of the search warrant. In many states like Texas, if a search warrant is issued, the executing officer is required to present a copy of the warrant to the property owner before the search begins. And this is really important. Make it clear. Here's why this is important. The warrant lays out the rules for the search. 
You need to see what those rules are, and you need to make sure you can't do anything about what they're going to be searching for based upon what's already been agreed to by the judge. But you can absolutely not consent. You can say, I do not consent to a search of anything else that's not provided under this search warrant. So very important because if you fail to do this, the officers will just search wherever they want. They'll get into your house and they'll start looking everywhere. And the officer only has the legal authority to search where the search warrant provides that legal authority. And anything beyond that, you need to make real clear that you do not consent to that. Okay. Now, number two, be calm. The worst thing you could possibly do is start yelling or getting in the officer's face. I've seen people do this over and over again, especially if they're innocent, but they get a little bit of a temper. And they say, I haven't done anything wrong. You're not coming in my house. You're not, there's, I've done nothing. You're No way. I'm Get out of my house, right? Well, guess what ends up happening? Even if there's just a bump, right? The officer grabs a hold of them, slams them down to the ground. They're now being charged with assault public servant. Or maybe the officer doesn't like their attitude. So what, is they, what do they do? Terroristic threat of an officer. Now, all of a sudden, this individual, even if they've done nothing wrong, they're going to jail now, and now there's going to end up being a full search of the entire house, and regardless of whether or not someone's done anything wrong one way or the other. So it's really important. The time to fight an illegal search is not right there at the scene. The time to fight the illegal search is in the courthouse with your lawyer contesting the Fourth Amendment violation. Number three, remain silent. Now, here's the thing. The worst thing that you could do when the police come into the house what they're going to do is they're going to begin asking questions. Oh, what do we have here? Hey, man, tell me a little bit of what's going on here. Now, listen, you know, if you don't tell me what's going on, this is only going to get worse for you because we already know what we're looking for. And so what they'll do is they want to match whatever they see in the home with anything they can get that homeowner to admit to or to talk about or to just not be able to respond to. So it's really important you have a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. You don't have to answer their questions at all. Be calm. Step back. Don't say anything. Let them do their thing and they can leave, okay? number The next thing, so that's number three is remain silent. Number four is you need to make sure you call your lawyer. Just like you have a Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, you have a Sixth Amendment right to retain counsel to fight this illegal search. Really important to do this because here's the thing. You say, well, why do I need a lawyer if I'm innocent? I haven't done anything wrong. It's when you're innocent, particularly, that you need an attorney. Do you think the police showed up at your house because they think you didn't do something? They're only at your house or your business or wherever they showed up to do this search because they already believe that you've done something wrong and they've already pinned you as the future arrestee. You're the person that's the suspect. That's why they're, re they're, they're going after this and they're doing what you're doing. So please understand, they're not there to be your friend and have a conversation with you. So you need to call a lawyer to fight this and get this thrown out, all right? Finally, number five, pull out your phone and document the entire search. And I'm going to explain to you why that's so important here in a second. But if you pull out your phone, there is nothing absolutely at all illegal about pulling out your phone, clicking record, and watching everything that these officers are doing to make sure they're doing so properly. And I'll explain that here in just a minute. Now, how do we challenge a search warrant? I'm going to first give you four ways that police officers can actually do a search without a warrant. It's called a warrantless search. And these are four very well-established principles under constitutional law. Number one of them is the plain view doctrine. That essentially means that if the officer walks up and sees something in plain view, a crime that's happened in plain view, a brick of cocaine, somebody walk, he walks up and sees someone assaulting another person, he doesn't have to do anything as it relates to a search. There. He doesn't have to have a warrant to either arrest or search. He's seen something in plain view and he can now arrest. I mean, he can now search as well. All right. So that's number one. Number two is consent. I know this only seems obvious, but if you consent to something, it cures all. The officer can search anywhere and everywhere they want to. In fact, they can tear stuff up. They'll start moving things out, ripping things apart. You see it happen all the time, which is why I told you at the very beginning, be very careful. Get the search warrant, review it, and say, I don't consent to anything else. Don't touch anything else. Don't search anything else. I don't consent to it. Make that real clear. Okay. Otherwise, they're going to claim that they have consent. So that's number two. Number three, stop and frisk. This is an example where if there's a reasonable suspicion that a person is either armed dangerous, or maybe has committed a crime, the officer then can search, and particularly searching your person, searching to make sure there's not a weapon um, or anything like that. That's another example where they don't have to have a warrant. Then number four, search is incident to arrest. So if someone has been lawfully arrested, the officer can then search that individual um, as incident to arrest. 
Okay, so those are four very well-established principles where you can, where an officer can actually do that search. But wait, here's the one I want to speak some time on is, what if the Fourth Amendment should clearly say that if an officer doesn't have a, uh, a search warrant and he searches your house, it's illegal, right? Usually, but not always. One example of that is what's known as the good faith exception. Now, if the officer makes a reasonable mistake, now focus on reasonable here, okay? If it's a reasonable mistake in conducting a search, evidence of, cr of a crime that was found as a result of that mistaken search can still sometimes be used against someone in court. It's called the good faith exception. Now, to trigger this exception, here's what's key. The police must behave properly throughout the entire search. Remember I told you earlier you need to have your phone and you need to record everything? The police must behave properly throughout the entire search in order for this good faith exception to kick in. They cannot engage in other misconduct or make obvious mistakes during the process that a reasonable, well-trained officer would not have made. Now, that's why the power of the cell phone is so important. The officer is going to be their word. They did everything properly, and that's in any job. People say they always do everything properly. It doesn't mean they did. You have a phone, and if that phone is recorded and it's able to show that that's the case, that that's not the case, then that's obviously going to give you an opportunity for that good faith exception not to kick in, okay? Now, for example, a reasonable officer should be able to determine when a warrant is too vague. If that warrant's too vague, but then, and they know like, hey, there's no way this even makes a whole lot of sense, but they continue to move forward, that's not going to trigger it. Here's another example, that if an officer gets a warrant as a result of their own misconduct, let's say they lied to an officer or they exaggerated, I'm sorry, to a judge, let's say they exaggerated to the judge some of the facts or information or took that information from a, a just well-established, unreliable source, and then that was the basis for where they were able to move forward with getting the judge to sign, then obviously that doesn't trigger that. That's not good faith. That's bad faith, okay? Now, some situations, though, when good faith exceptions do apply, let me give you some examples. Number one is when police agencies make a mistake in maintaining their warrant databases, and maybe there's some confusion, some confusion over the actual suspect name, and that's just like an administrative error. Okay. Number two is a mistake of law by a police officer can sometimes trigger this exception. So we've seen this happen where an officer believes the existing interpretation of the law is one way, but it's actually not that way. And then evidence is obtained as a result of that. Courts will say, well, even though the officer got it wrong, he acted in good faith. He was acting on what he thought the law was. So we're going to go ahead and allow the evidence to be used. That's actually, there's court precedent for that that even though the cop got it wrong and he was acting on an interpretation of the law that's not true, they've still allowed that to, to follow through. So think about that for a second. That's one of those examples. So what if the police, I'm going to give you this, what if the police seize your phone and then they get a warrant afterward? Now that's illegal. And I see cops do this now. I've seen them where they'll take somebody's phone and then they'll look to go get a warrant after they've already taken it. Really important. The only time that they can get away with doing that is under what's known as exigent circumstances. And essentially what that means is they're going to have to believe that there's going to be destruction of evidence. That's the only exception that would apply here. That if they didn't seize the phone outside of having a warrant, that there would, there would be an immediate destruction of evidence on that phone. And a police officer must show that they had probable cause to believe that the phone contained criminal evidence at the time the phone was taken, not later. Can't be based on information they obtained later. Must be at the time that they obtained that phone, okay? Now, what are some examples? We've talked about some, some ways of looking at search warrants. How are some ways that your attorney can fight this in court and win? I'm going to give you a few points here to think about. Number one is lack of probable cause. Now, let me tell you this. When you have a search warrant, you have two parts to it. You have the warrant itself and you have a search warrant affidavit. Okay, The affidavit are, is the actual attached documentation that has all the facts for which the court would rely upon to determine if there was probable cause. The actual, search, the actual search warrant itself is not very impressive. There's not a whole lot to look at. It's the affidavit that your attorney is going to want to see because it must, on the four corners of that document, establish sufficient evidence to lay out probable cause for them to be able to have done the search to begin with. Okay, So you can attack that. Many times we'll find that some of those search warrants, those affidavits are not written properly or they're based upon uh, information that's not credible. So that's the first, is probable cause. Number two is the application was not made under oath. Sounds like a technical issue, but particularly in Texas, that's a requirement. It must, be, it must actually be made under oath. Number three, here's a big one. 
false statements or questionable motives of an information source or confid of a confidential informant. This is big in drug cases because your criminal lawyer has a right to know where and which in like who was the person that made these statements or you know shared this information with the police that gave them the probable cause to then be able to search. And this happens a lot in drug cases where there's some confidential informant. Here's what happens. Cops will pull over somebody coming from a known drug house and they'll basically tell them, hey, I'm going to take you to jail. and I'm going to haul you off here unless you'll flip three people. Tell me all the information that you know about these other people. And if you don't tell me, I'm going to I'm going to run you up the chain here and you're going to end up. And it's usually first time offenders. They do that too. that person becomes a confidential informant that then begins to tell information about anyone and everyone that they know. And then those officers will use that information from that confidential informant to then obtain a search warrant to go and search these individuals' homes or wherever, any property that they might have in order to be able to see if they can find anything illegal. And they work their way up the chain, trying to find the primary providers of what are these drugs are. So understand in that situation, if the officer did this and that's how they obtained the probable cause for the search warrant, it's important that good criminal lawyers can actually burn that confidential informant by determining who they are, putting them on the witness stand and determining, was there a motive for them to say what they said? Is it based off of a lie? Is there anything credible here to base it off of? And then as they attack that, that could be the basis for a motion to suppress to determine that the search warrant was actually a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so that's a more important one. Number four, what if property that was searched or seized was not specified in the warrant? Remember, I told you to make sure and record everything. This is a critical part here where I, I, I've seen people, I've seen officers do this. If someone records the entire search, sometimes you can see the officers are just running roughshod over a home. And in the process of doing that, they have more than exceeded the boundary of what was provided for within that search warrant. If that's the case, you have a right to review the search warrant and make it clear that you do not consent and anything that goes beyond the scope of that search warrant. That is why the cops, look, that's why the cops, they're probably going to fight you over you wanting to record it, but it is not illegal. You can absolutely record just like an arrest. You can record what's going on here. Just like when officers pull you over, you can have a camera in your vehicle. You can have your cell phone running at the time recording what's going on. There's nothing illegal about that at all. Finally, failure to provide a copy of the warrant to the property owner, and especially in Texas. Listen, that's why you should ask for it, okay? Notice, I've given you kind of a rundown of what to know and how, what steps to take if you find yourself on the wrong end of a search warrant coming your way. The big takeaway here is don't fight it at the scene. Follow these steps. Fight it in court, and particularly if you're innocent. Listen, you do have rights. You have Fourth Amendment rights. You have a Fifth Amendment right, and you also have a Sixth Amendment right to make sure your attorney is able to fight this for you in court. So I hope this has been helpful for you. We'll see you on our next video.